And, and really, as I said, uh, Stefan has given you a very good background to why I'm studying uh, the London private banker in 18th century society. And um, I'm just going to start off with uh, a, a, some images to get your minds thinking about the, these uh, individuals. Um, and uh, I should right away start by, by saying with, when I mean the private bankers, um, what I'm talking about here um, are, in, in modern terms, what we would think of as retail bankers. These are high street bankers. Uh, these are uh, bankers that have customers who leave deposits uh, in their banks, and they take those deposits and they reinvest them and make their money. Uh, they provide certain very personal services. Um, and uh, there are other types of bankers we will come across. Um, uh, in, in the late 17th century, for instance, most of the private bankers providing those services would be goldsmith bankers. Um, uh, these were goldsmiths, uh, artisans, uh, who would... Uh, uh, provide um, uh, the goldsmithing business, they would uh, make jewellery, they would repair jewellery, uh, they would uh, provide security for plates, uh, they would even ex start to extend loans on the security of, of these valuables. Um, so we will see the goldsmith bankers, and they will be the direct uh, predecessors uh, of the private bankers that I'm going to talk about today. The term private banker comes into common use by about the 1760s. Uh, the goldsmiths have been going since really the 1650s to 1660s uh, as bankers. But today I, I want to show the development of the private banking business. Uh, and these are the characters. Some of the names you know, are, are still banking. Uh, uh, Henry Hall um, uh, uh, at the bottom uh, of the picture on, the, on horseback. He, 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 uh, uh, he was known as Henry the Magnificent, a um, uh, wonderful character. Uh, uh, his bank is still going. It's still providing personalised uh, bespoke uh, concierge, I'm told, concierge uh, financial services uh, for a, a privileged uh, elite. Um, and you will see the name uh, on the top rank of Thomas Coots. Coots uh, uh, has been bought by um, uh, other banks and indeed is part owned by the state at the moment after the last banking crisis. Uh, but uh, he is the founder of the, the, the modern uh, bank of Coots. Uh, so some of these banks are, are incredibly durable. Um, but what you won't see here actually are the names of Rothschild um, or Goldsmith or let's say Kleinhort because those banks are uh, merchant banks um, and these are banks that develop in uh, the late 18th century, early 19th century uh, who are much more focused on providing uh, the financing of trade. Um, and they are self-capitalized, they do not have deposits. Uh, so it's a different sort of formation. Um, why I'm interested in these retail private bankers uh, is very much linked to, to what Stefan has said about my previous work on, on merchants. Um, and what I wanted to always find was a group of uh, commercial men and I should stress that these guys, despite appearances, are commercial men. Um, uh, commercial men who actually worked with the upper orders, uh, the, the landed uh, aristocracy and landed gentlemen. Uh, because I've always wanted, I've, most of the merchants that I looked at, uh, with few, only a few exceptions, William Beckford, for instance, never really interacted with the upper orders, um, uh, the upper landed orders, very, very much. Um, but here, th this group actually uh, were uh, a group 
that did seem to uh, establish long-term and actually pretty um, stable relationships uh, with the upper orders. And I thought that this was a group that was worth knowing some, something more about. Uh, and today, the, the, the title of the, call, uh, the, the paper is Friends and, and Countrymen. Um, and what I'm going to hopefully show is that the way in which they stabilised their relationship with the upper orders was, again, it was not through aping or, or, or copying the upper orders in terms of their principles or, or their values, uh, but it was actually by finding common ground uh, between themselves and the upper orders. And this is why they, they will ultimately become the friends. Uh, this is a very uh, particular uh, phrase that they use a great deal in the course of these relationships. They become the friends of the countrymen. Um, and uh, I will show, hopefully, that, again, what we see in this group is a, a very important phenomenon, um, which is that these men of commerce become very rich, the, these guys are very wealthy. Um, they're very successful um, by the late 18th, 30th, 19th century. But they do not leave commerce when they have made their money. They stabilize uh, their commercial uh, resources. Uh, they might, you know, sort of, um, oops, should go. They might look like gentlemen uh, and they might act in a polite way. Um, but in fact, at heart, they, they remain, remain uh, men of commerce, uh, and they manage to stabilize uh, uh, very intimate relationships uh, with the most powerful landed individuals uh, in the country. So that's, that's the story I, I want to, to tell you today. Um, I mean, you know, in, in historiographical terms, um, there has been some very good work undertaken on the private bankers when it comes to the economic operations of their companies. Um, and uh, I will pay due credit to them uh, in the course of the talk. Uh, but there has not been very much uh, uh, work done on the social and cultural relationships uh, that this group established through their work. Uh, I mean, they have appeared in, in some older studies um, as part of a, a big bourgeoisie, uh, which uh, perhaps you know, would buy some landed acres and they might marry their children you know, in, into minor gentry fa families. Um, and they might indeed begin to look like uh, gentlemen. What I want to stress is that the true accommodation uh, between uh, the bankers, the private bankers, and the landed orders is much more intimate. It's much more personal. Uh, and it's actually much more assured and will ensure common benefit uh, for all parties. So uh, how do I intend uh, to, to do this? As uh, Stefan very rightly says, I, I like prosopography, uh, I like group study, and I've been looking at three samples of bankers, um, one of which is uh, in the late 17th century. Uh, in 1677, we're very lucky to have a list of um, uh, about uh, 50 bankers uh, who were active uh, uh, providing what was called running caches, which is essentially a, a, a credit line. Um, uh, for various uh, groups. Um, so one from the late 17th century, one from the 1730s, which I think is a particularly interesting stage for the development of private banking, uh, and then another in the 1780s, uh, which sees the bankers establish themselves uh, very securely uh, as part, if you like, of a, a national uh, financial system. Uh, and I have been doing the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm always of the opinion that it's good for historians to learn from 
older generations of historians as well as more modern uh, era approaches. So I have done the, if you like, the, 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 the methods of the uh, 1970s and the 1980s where uh, scholars would look at uh, the purchase of landed estates and marriage and education, et cetera, et cetera. I have done that. Um, but I, what I've also been looking at in, in the wider work is how in both work um, and indeed outside of work, how the private bankers interact with national society. You know, that's at the heart of everything. And as you'll see today, you know, what will I do today? Um, well, first of all, uh, I'm going to be uh, looking at um, uh, a little bit uh, at the, the banking houses um, and actually showing, uh, again, the sense of place, how the banking house becomes uh, a site of accommodation between these groups and allows bankers to um, uh, perform uh, a role um, and to establish a role of friendship. Uh, with the upper orders. Uh, then uh, I will talk uh, a little bit about the way in which the, the staff, uh, the, the employees of these banks, how they interacted with, with the upper orders. And then I'll finish with uh, a few examples uh, of uh, a successful, friendly relationship between private bankers and some of the most powerful families uh, in the land. Okay, um, and I have got some more slides beyond that uh, during questions. If, if uh, uh, I need to illustrate any any answers. So first of all, um, uh, I think you you probably need a, a little bit of an overview of um, what's happening uh, in the, in terms of the development of of the profession. And uh, these figures are provided by other scholars, um, and uh, you know, again, Jocelyn here and, and Hilton Pryor. You know, a lot of really good uh, work has been done uh, uh, on the numbers of banks, you know, sort of in London. So hopefully you can see straight away, I mean, this is the overall total on this side. Um, in 1725, uh, this is... Uh, in the wake of the, the famous South Sea bubble at the same time as the, the Mississippi scheme in France, uh, we, we have only 24 uh, banks. Um, by uh, 1786, that number has doubled uh, in number. We're in 1770. So what we're seeing is the, um, the growth and, and stabilization of uh, banking uh, at the heart of uh, uh, London life, uh, British life more generally. The way in which it's organised um, is, uh, as you can see, uh, Lombard Street, which is in the city of London, uh, traditionally had been the, the one of the homes of goldsmithing and, and uh, bank lending. Um, as you can see, there's a high concentration of, of banks there, and uh, those bankers will be primarily looking towards the, the city of London merchants and businessmen uh, and providing uh, various services, especially uh, lending um, services as well as the discounting of bills. Also of great interest is the, <coughs> the, the growth of um, banks in uh, Fleet Street and, and the West. And if I've done this right, uh, we can illustrate this. Yep. Uh, so this, this is the River Thames, this is the West End, the so-called West End of London. Uh, you've got Covent Garden and Leicester Square, St James's Park here. Uh, and this is the great work done by uh, Ian Black. He, you know, he shows that uh, the banks really uh, start to expand to the West um, as the metropolitan uh, landed elites, as the landed elites actually come into the metropolis uh, in, well, really from the late 17th century on, and start to populate these beautiful squares um, with their beautiful homes. Um, and you can actually see very readily uh, how uh, they, uh, the bankers are uh, establishing themselves 
on the high street um, in the key part of uh, the West End. So uh, just to go back here, um, uh, so you can see that the number just steadily increases you know, th throughout the period. Um, so there are those sort of uh, two concentrations. Um, I mean, and one thing to say, of course, this does reflect uh, a significant increase to, of the number of customers that, that you have. Uh, if I, we were looking in the late 17th century, I think probably if you put all the banks together, I said it's somewhere around about 50 at any one time, where uh, we don't have the, the exact records, but from what we know, maybe 10,000 people had an account. These are fairly small org organizations. I think by about 1800, you know, the, these banks are 80 to 100,000. So we are, you know, what we're seeing, what has been quite an elite um, service, has actually become uh, the uh, provision for um, the middling sorts uh, as, a, as a whole. Uh, it's become very well established. So uh, this, this is you know, a, a very, very significant uh, sort of change. Um, and what we also see here is that, and this is behind the figures, um, is that these banks are also becoming very, very stable <coughs> enterprises. In the late 17th and early 18th century, there was a high, high risk, these were high risk ventures. Uh, in fact, in 1725, of those 24 uh, banks, probably only three or four could boast uh, a longevity of 30 or 40 years. Um, it was only a handful, and it is the whores, the childs that I showed you earlier on. Um, by the 1780s, uh, of these 52 banks, probably half of those banks uh, had been around for 50 years. Um, and in fact, of those 52 banks, uh, about two thirds will survive through to 1816. Uh, they'll go through all of the upheavals of the Revolutionary Wars, the, the Napoleonic era, and they will survive. Um, so we're actually seeing a much sta more stable system. Um, and that actually, I think, is, is so important because I'll keep coming back to the virtue of stability uh, with these bankers. Because what that does, more than anything else, uh, it overcomes a sort of a historic suspicion towards the commercial classes as a, uh, as a, a temporary group. These, they're, they're often seen, if they're successful, they make their money and they leave commerce. Uh, if they're not successful, they just disappear. There's the sense that they are not a permanent presence. Mm. Well, by the early 18th century, these banks uh, can uh, convey a sense of permanence, uh, of durability, and that affects the success of their banks and also their relationship with the upper mm. orders. And it's very important to see that the bankers worked hard uh, in order to convey that permanence. And I'm going to uh, come down now to, to these banking houses. Um, and, and these are, a, are just a couple of examples. That, um, and this comes from the work of, of Ian Black, um, whose articles are, he's an architectural historian rather than a, a broader social historian. Um, but what we're seeing is that these are uh, the banks that become a familiar site on um, the, the London High Street, uh, if you like. First of all, um, Child's Bank. Uh, <coughs> this is a, a late 17th century uh, sort of building. Um, and the first thing you'll notice here is it's very unremarkable. Uh, you know, this is a, a very typical um, uh, post-fire, post-great fire house. Um, very thin. This is right next door to uh, one of the gates of London, Temple Bar, that used to be right there. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, it has no real claim to distinction. But that's important for a bank. 
um, because these banks are looking after the deposits of their customers. And if they are throwing money at a building, um, then perhaps they're not showing um, the proper care uh, that they should be with uh, other people's money. Um, and in fact, uh, Child's banks there from the 1670s uh, through to the 1870s, they don't change at all. We will go inside Child's later on. But, uh, and what that reminds us is that there are different ways to uh, convey uh, a sense of durability. Um, here, its unchanging nature uh, and its modesty is the main message. But there are different ways of, of doing it. Um, this is the Askill Bank, um, actually in Lombard Street. Um, and actually, this reminds us, if we were thinking, where would you find a West End bank? What would it look like? You might think that was it. But actually, that's in the, the city of London. Uh, this is actually one of the, the Western banks with uh, a very genteel uh, customer base. Now, Askell's Bank uh, dates from 1756 uh, to 7, and this is a much more polite uh, essay uh, in city architecture. Um, and what we, uh, we, we can actually put that down, th in this case, to individual choice, uh, because Askill himself uh, wanted to promote the city of London. Uh, uh, he had indeed, he spent money on a, a new carriage, a new coach uh, for uh, the, uh, the mayor of London for his uh, ceremonial day. And it is that carriage which they use to this day, in fact, it is still in use. Um, and he clearly wanted to put forward uh, uh, a more polite um, uh, performance of durability. Uh, he wanted to give the sense that, you know, through the classical architecture here, um, that, uh, and the, you know, the heavy rustication, you know, of the shop front, he wanted to give the impression that uh, this bank is here to stay. So there are different ways, you know, to sort of convey um, uh, uh, the, the ethos of a bank. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly, um, as I said, Askill's Bank becomes, you know, sort of very well known. Um, and uh, it, it is, you know, certainly celebrated um, uh, in certain city circles. Um, but in fact, most city banks uh, that we'll see are, are much more modest. They're much more l like this. But it, it's important to see that, uh, you know, especially by the 1750s, um, that some bankers realised that uh, specialist premises would be needed to advance their, their trade. And um, I'll just give you an example of this specialism of the banker by comparing them to uh, another form of banker. Uh, and this is actually the, the first base of the Rothschild family uh, in the City of London. This is New Court, which is very much in the heart of, of uh, uh, commercial London, just around the corner from the Bank of England. Um, and at this stage, um, you know, the Rothschilds are merchants and developing and becoming merchant bankers. And so they don't need a shop front to the high street. In fact, what they need is storage, you know, for their goods and a headquarters you know, uh, these would be offices for developing their trade and, you know, s some living quarters above. And this is tucked away in, in a corner. Uh, it's not on the high street. So what we're seeing is that the private bankers are developing uh, very much uh, a specialist um, reputation, uh, a specialist role uh, within metropolitan commerce. And this will continue uh, to develop um, into the later um, 18th century. Um, these are two banks that uh, appear at the turn of uh, the 19th century, so 
late 1790s, early 1800s. And both of these are in the city of London. And what we can see here is that the, these are the, the need for bigger premises, uh, that's usually why uh, they'll, they'll build uh, a new house. But we're seeing that this, yes, there will be um, a bit of decoration on the ground floor, but these are actually just developing into um, uh, office space, if you like. Um, the, note the, the amount of light, you know, especially working on big ledges, etc., etc. They are functional spaces. Um, and, and this actually settles down into becoming the model uh, of a bank, uh, a private bank, uh, by the early 19th century. And what's interesting is that that sort of model starts to influence the, the Western bankers. Because um, this is Hawes Bank, uh, a new bank that was uh, built in 1829. And uh, this is on Fleet Street, so again, uh, sort of on that sort of east-west axis in, in the metropolis. And what we see here, again, you know, I'll just flick between them, because you can see, so that's the city of London. Even the Western banks are starting to imitate um, the city bank. So we're actually seeing, even though the clientele and the, the, the services provided at banks at the east and the west is different, um, they're beginning to merge into a, a, a commercial profession. Um, and what's particularly interesting uh, about Hawes is that what we know that there was an earlier plan which actually had a, um, a sort of a, a Greek portico uh, at one end, so a, a nice grand state, you know, architectural statement. Um, uh, and as uh, Ian Black has shown, that uh, uh, in fact that was deemed to be too magnificent for a house of commons. So they didn't have it. And instead, what we have here is a, a rather modest you know, sort of front door. And this little squiggle here, you can't really make it out, um, is actually, uh, what it's, a, it's a bottle. It's like a leather pouch bottle. Um, uh, and it was, it was actually, uh, and it's still to this day, it's, there, it's gold, it's made of gold. Um, and that had been the sign of the Hall uh, goldsmiths in the 17th century. So it's harking back again. It's a subtle reminder that we have been through everything with our customers and we are still here. So even though we, as I said, we, you know, it's, uh, the, the actual buildings show that the, the private bankers are settling into uh, their place on the high street. They have become a stable uh, form of um, commercial profession, if you like. Um, and certainly um, they've had to go through a lot of trouble. I don't want to give the sense that any of their achievement is easy. It's not. Um, but they knew time and time again that they had to reassure a wider public. They had to reassure that wider public that they're not misspending the money um, that is deposited with them and that, in fact, that uh, banking, private banking, is both useful and stable. And, um, you know, certainly... Um, once you get into these banks, uh, some of the, uh, into the interiors, um, most of them are very um, underwhelming. <laughs> um, I mean, this is uh, a cartoon from the uh, 17, uh, uh, well, it's circa 1760. Um, and basically, uh, this is the, again, this is in the city of London. Um, and this is the bankruptcy of this gentleman here, who is William uh, Belshear, um, uh, a city banker who goes bust in, in, in that year. He was a, a member of parliament, quite a, quite a high profile individual, who actually had um, customers from both the middling sorts and um, the, um, the landed sorts. And what's actually happening here is that various customers are coming through demanding their money. Um, and what I like about this is that um, 
uh, it gives a sense of you know, the dramas that sometimes happen in these spaces. But just look at the uh, interior, it's very plain, it's very plain indeed. Um, but do notice at the back of um, uh, the shop, uh, you can see uh, uh, just some more elegant chairs. Um, and these back parlours is where the more private discussions between bankers and, and customers would take place. And in fact, what, what he's doing there is arguing with his partners. Um, so so that's the, these are you know, fairly underwhelming uh, spaces. Um, and it, it shows that the bankers are providing uh, real services. Now, by the 1730s, um, uh, however, the bankers are becoming a little bit more ambitious. Um, uh, and... Um, even though I, I, I don't have the interior plans uh, on, on my memory stick at the moment. Um, this is the forerunner to, to Coote's Bank. Uh, this is the so-called Middle, Middleton Bank um, in the late 1730s. Uh, and what's very interesting about uh, this moment, it, you know, the, the fact that um, uh, Middleton is deciding to build quite a... Uh, again, an architecturally uh, significant statement. Um, this is very much a sort of a, a West End house um, in the late 1730s. I think it does show that uh, bankers, particularly in the West End, uh, are really trying to capture the imagination as well as the money of, of the landed orders. And we're lucky that we actually have the specifications uh, of the interior and uh, this th little pediment here uh, actually marks the fact that the the parlor room that I just mentioned where uh, uh, more discreet uh, conversations would happen uh, we, we have the spec specifications for that room and it, the, the architect was told to copy a West End uh, reception room so very much you know, sort of targeting those upper orders. Um, and there was even uh, a water closet there which would had a, a mahogany uh, uh, seat for aristocratic um, back time. So they, they really are thinking of, of, of everything. Um, but also one, one thing that they um, don't uh, look to save money on and, and they will spend big money on is actually uh, locks and iron gates and iron uh, shutters. Um, you know, this is a very secure space as well. And that's you know, another of the, the messages they want to get across. Because um, as early as the, the 1720s, 1730s, we know that uh, criminals are targeting uh, these spaces. You know, they've realized that these are places where uh, significant sums of money um, are, uh, and they are very keen uh, to protect them. So even though it does look like um, a, a West End house, uh, we have to realise that, um, you know, that this is a serious business within it. Um, and even though there will be performance, there has to be good service. Now, um, by, with, with the appearance of these banks, um, we actually do begin to see a lot of commentary um, from uh, various uh, social critics uh, who start to pick up on the social prominence you know, of these bankers. Um, they have moved away from their goldsmithing roots and they are now uh, performing uh, you know, sort of very direct financial services for both the, the landed and com commercial elites of the country. Um, and as a sign of this, in, in 1784, uh, Pitt, uh, the, um, the younger, the prime minister, uh, introduces a shop tax. Um, uh, and there's a big debate about whether bankers qualify and as a shop or not. I mean, as goldsmiths, yes, they had a shop. And in fact, uh, a lot of bankers, uh, you know, sometimes to prove how durable they are, would refer to the bank as the shop. You know, they, they, 
in some ways there's a bit of in, inverse snobbery there um, uh, because they know it stresses their longevity. Um, but some bankers you know, reject being shopkeepers. Uh, a, a nice, nice quote um, from a, a city banker, his name is Nathaniel Newman. He said that no judge could ever convince him that he was a shopkeeper. So uh, they are proud of their, their, their status. Um, I mean, again, this, this is based on a, a commercial eminence, a uh, commercial utility, and they want to be seen uh, above the uh, other retailers on, on the high streets. Um, and um, this prominence, this social prominence, um, does see, see them receive a great deal of criticism, uh, uh, especially uh, at any point when there is a financial crisis or um, there is a, 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 a difficulty with the economy. Um, I mean, for instance, in the, the mid-1790s, uh, we, we will see that um, uh, uh, critics would complain about what they called the empiricism or uh, empiric empiricism, is that okay? Empiric um, what, it, what they mean about that is um, that the performance of the bankers is hiding the reality. Um, I mean, what they complain is, and uh, here's a quote, um, that they were, well, they were uh, accused of deception. Um, uh, and one critic said their, their magnificent shops, their uh, plate glass windows, uh, their mahogany counters uh, and shovels full of gold. You know, they're giving the impression that they have endless uh, resources, when in fact they don't. Um, and there are some failures in the, the 1790s. Um, and, and this is actually seen in some quarters uh, that the banks are claiming a dangerous credit. Okay? So the, the actual verdict on a banker, uh, whether they'll be received well uh, by the most powerful in, in the country is another matter. But moving away from, from the buildings, um, the, the bankers also um, were very keen to ensure that their staff um, uh, presented themselves uh, well. And they really did see the staff as a way to create uh, an almost club-like feeling um, uh, with, within the bank. Um, and there's been some very, very good work done recently on the Bank of England by Anne Murphy, um, uh, who's, I recommend her book from last year, uh, virtuous uh, bankers, it's called. Um, very odd title in some ways, um, very provocative title. Um, and it looks at the Bank of England and the way uh, on the public stage how the Bank of England uh, arranged not only their buildings but also their staff uh, in order to send reassuring messages about the solidity of public credit. Well, these private bankers, in essence, you do exactly the same. And I'll, I'll just give you, so, again, some images here to give you uh, a, an idea of what's going on in, in the interiors. And this, just to set the scene, this is just a, an interior of uh, Child's Bank, which we saw earlier. And just to say, it, it's very ordinary. <laughs> That's the only point I want to make about it. Um, you know, there, there are these counters here. Um, and it, you know, there, there isn't a, you know, a, a sense of grandeur at all. And we saw the building. It didn't promise much. It doesn't deliver much. But what we actually see, um, and this, this is a very lucky survival, um, is that in Childs, they, they have a, a um, one of the staff was a cartoonist. <laughs> um, very, very lucky. Um, and in the late 1790s, early 1800s, uh, he leaves lots of pictures of uh, life <coughs> in the bank um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll just show you a couple, because you know, we haven't got too much time. Uh, but what, what this shows, it's 1797, okay, this is a, a peak period of pressure during the, the Revolutionary Wars, uh, the Bank of England 
you know, suspends cash payments this, this year. Everyone is thinking what's going to happen next. Um, and what we actually see here is, again, there's, there's that counter we just saw. Um, and what we have is uh, uh, a bank clerk. Um, uh, and we, we have various um, customers who are demanding their money. They, they want their money. They want to take the money out. Uh, and he's saying, what do you say? He's pretending not to hear them. You know. um, and you know, he, it's called the dollar chancellor. Um, and uh, in essence, what it's showing is that you know, they can rely on their staff to uh, help support the bank both in on the good days and also on, on the bad days. I'll give you another one. These are all very good. Um, this is uh, samples of gentility. Um, and what, uh, what it says here is that here are the staff. Um, and in fact, a lady who's got a very fashionable hat on can't find her way out of, of the bank. Um, so they are showing gently guiding her. Uh, out of the bank. So that sense of um, service, that sense of uh, supporting the bank uh, in uh, the character uh, of their day-to-day um, uh, -day duties is crucial to setting the tone for these banks. Now, um, they do this because, again, they, they are under pressure. And just give you another sample of that. Um, this is the so-called the Bank Macaroni of, of 1773. Um, it comes in the wake, again, of a, a, a pressure moment on the British economy, uh, the so-called um, uh, air, air Bank Crisis in 1772, when a Scottish bank uh, went bankrupt and caused uh, an earthquake of credit um, problems. Uh, which did reach the metropolis and the rest of the country. Um, and bankers were being widely censured at that moment, and there was calls for regulation of the private banking sector. Well, this um, uh, Matthew Darley, uh, well-known satirist, he, he turns his attention to the bankers, and he says, the problem is, is that all the bankers want to be gentlemen, basically. And... This actually is one of their staff, even worse. Th this is a member of staff uh, who should be you know, modestly dressed and, and serving the customer. And he's got the, the beautiful coat with the, the gold um, uh, braiding and buttons. Um, and um, and we, we also see it in the next one, which is 1805, another difficult year uh, for the economy. And again, uh, we have an honest, rustic gentleman with his uh, loyal hound, his loyal dog, again, uh, coming in and wanting uh, to be, be paid you know, his money. Um, and the, the staff are, are delaying him. Um, and you can see the, the, the rich uh, waistcoats there. And there is one of the shovels full of gold that uh, we were talking about uh, earlier on. So uh, the actual staff are under great pressure to uh, act for and provide uh, a great deal of support for the company in their day-to-day -day, uh, re relationships. And, um, and the, the banks do not, um, you know, they take every opportunity to reassure customers that they're acting in their interest. And um, here's uh, an interesting um, ad advertisement, I in essence, uh, from a bank. This is the Harry's Bank, which is a, a West End bank. Um, and uh, they're writing in 1816 about the change of partnership. Um, and it's a very, you, you, could, you, you can read this better than I can. <laughs> um, but what I would pu pull out here is that every phrase uh, underscores certain principles uh, that the bank want to emphasize about their relationship with customers. Um, and um, it's, you know, it says we're, we're just having a, a retirement uh, here, uh, but there's nothing to see um, because he will be uh, replaced um, 
and we will not change anything here. You know, aucun changement. You know, there will be no change you know, uh, whatsoever. Um, and it also um, uh, it talks about you know sort of um, uh, the retirement, the retiring uh, individual uh, as someone you know who you know is uh, you know, ce bon et respectable ami. You know, they're using a language of, of friendship uh, to convey the intimacy of the banks to Paul. Um, and they say, you know, sort of, uh, 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 Sir Halliday um, will, will, will take over, uh, will be promoted within the company. Um, and they stress that he's worked here for a long time uh, and he has, you know, sort of our entire uh, confidence. Okay? So, the, this sort of relationship is, it's very important to work uh, at the confidence of the customer. And, you know, especially at key moments of change within a firm, they would want to make sure that uh, customers were reassured. Um, and these are just, you know, some, I, you know the time prevents me going on too long, but there are lots of other strategies that uh, the banks use to, to build relationships. And I think it's probably best if I just show you um, uh, a banker in action. Um, and this is uh, uh, Thomas Coots. Here he is, here. And in many ways, you know, Coots could be represented as the um, uh, the epitome of the um, uh, empirical banker who is trying to ensure uh, that he looks um, extremely um, uh, assured and that his bank will, will never fail. Uh, and, you know, and that your money is as safe with Thomas Coots as it would be in the Bank of England. Um, and uh, he is actually incredibly successful at this. Um, he uh, starts in, in uh, the Middleton Bank in, in the 1750s. By the 1770s, he's become the head of the bank and he will last in that job until his death 50 years later. Um, and his bank had royals, um, uh, members of the royal household uh, as customers. Uh, many of the uh, English aristocracy, many of the Scottish aristocracy, um, and uh, his, in fact, his profits uh, during those 50 years, I think, you know, increase six or sevenfold. You know, he is a very successful um, individual. Now, um, what I would suggest here is that what Coots does very well are, are two things. One, he's a very good banker um, in the sense that he he understands uh, the city very well. He comes from a merchant background. Uh, in fact, his apprenticeship was in merchant, uh, in merchant firms. Uh, and he works extremely hard. Um, so one thing is to say he can provide the commercial basis of success for both customer and, and the bank. What he's also very good at is, if you like, the soft skills of dealing with often very demanding and difficult uh, aristocratic patrons. Um, he has some very difficult people. He has Charles James Fox. He has the Duchess of Devonshire. He has the Prince of Wales. He has the nightmare people <laughs> of uh, 18th and 19th century London. Um, and he manages to perform miracles in creating very stable relationships. Um, and uh, what I want to say is just go through some of those customers just to show how, how he did it. Um, and the first one I'm going to show is, is Hester Pitt, uh, Countess of, of Chatham. And what's very interesting is that w women are, um, they are a, a minority of customers um, for, for most banks, but they are a sig significant minority uh, of, of customers. Uh, you know, the figures that we have, they might be... 18%, so not an insignificant uh, presence in customer lists. Um, and what Coots does with Hester Pitt, who is um, 
uh, the wife of Pip the Elder and, and the father, uh, the mother of uh, Pip uh, the, the Younger. Um, uh, the Pip manages to uh, build a very strong relationship with her. Uh, first of all, by providing um, uh, connections to ensure that uh, Pip the Elder is paid what the government owes him, you know, even after his death. Uh, and Pip almost becomes uh, uh, a sort of mentor or father figure um, for her when Pip dies in, in 1777. Um, and uh, it, she is faced with a very difficult you know, situation uh, financially. And uh, what we see is that Coots um, uh, plays a brilliant game with her. We, we have their correspondence. And it lasts for nearly 40 years um, uh, until her death. And uh, we can see, in fact, that Pitt the Younger doesn't really like Coots because he feels that Coots is stepping too far into family affairs at times. Um, but uh, only on one occasion did uh, Coots uh, have to let the, the family down, uh, which is in 1797, which I said was a very difficult year, uh, and he can't advance any loans. But he does turn on, um, you know, he, he does reassure her that, um, that they are friends um, and that they're friends when things change, things will be better. And he can, uh, you know, there are doubts in her mind but he does deliver on his promises. And he does you know, stress that, you know, uh, again, his bank is one of the old banks and will always look after uh, his customers. Um, so, uh, indeed, Hester Pitt remains a loyal customer until her death in 1803. The next one, uh, William Wyndham Grenville, uh, who's, in fact, the nephew of Hester Pitt, um, the, the, the very strong link between um, the, the Grenville and Pitt families. And this is a future Prime Minister. Uh, now, Pitt um, is very, uh, sorry, um, Coote is very keen to um, ensure that Grenville becomes a customer um, uh, because Grenville was clearly on, on the rise in, in governing, governing circles. Um, and, uh, in fact, uh, Grenville does become a customer um, uh, by the age of 27. Um, and with only, within a few years, is Foreign Secretary. Uh, and, in fact, Coots can use his connections to Grenville to get um, uh, payments made to Coots companies by the government. So there, there, is a, there are, are commercial incentives here. But what's interesting is that you know Coots doesn't ask for uh, for more than that. He doesn't ask for significant favours. This is just the money that he's owed. Um, and Grenville learns to respect that. Um, I mean, in turn, Grenville asks Coots um, for for money, uh, for loans, uh, for both himself and his friends. And almost invariably, uh, Coots can come up with money, even when the money is for gambling debts. Uh, he will you know, sort of be keen to help. Um, and Grenville, you know, and it's important to see this, um, that Grenville used the, uses the language of friendship too um, and you know, recognises that Coots is treating him as a friend. Um, um, oh, uh, I'll come back to that. That's, I mean, that's Coots's uh, modest clothing. We'll come back to that maybe. Um, it doesn't always work. This is the, the artist, uh, Thomas Lawrence, or Sir Thomas Lawrence. Um, and Lawrence actually knows that Coots is uh, a big, uh, big supporter of the arts. Uh, and in fact, Coots kept uh, a box uh, at the, um, the theatre which he loaned out to customers, again, just soft skills. Um, and um, Tom, Thomas Lawrence uh, uh, is one of his really difficult uh, customers because Lawrence plays on Coots's love of the arts. And whenever um, uh, Coots presses him to 
pay his overdraft, uh, which at, at his death is over two thousand pounds. So it's a you know significant debt. Um, whenever uh, Coutts presses him, he he suggests that that sort of pressure will mean that he cannot paint. Um, uh, so, you know, they, they, you know, it's not that the bankers have it all their own way. Their customers, you know, can uh, navigate the relationship too. Um, and m many members of the bank, you know, were very un unhappy with it. Just uh, I can see the time, so we, we're up to nearly an hour. One more sort of Coots image is that at the end of his life, Coots actually you know, makes a, a significant mistake. When, uh, he had, when he was 80, aged 80, uh, in 1815, he actually married a young actress. Um, um, I'm looking forward to that stage of my life <laughs> in, in many ways, um, uh, the exciting stage. Um, and he, he, was, um, he was roundly censured. Um, you know, this was a sign that you know, the great banker was losing his mind. You know. um, I think that's harsh. I think it, you know, he was genuine, genuinely um, tender towards, her, uh, to, towards the actress, um, Harriet Mellon. Um, and uh, he actually um, took a great risk because he knew that it was a sign of, of weakness um, uh, or would be seen as such and it might have an effect on, on his bank. And what we have here is, is the fact you know, that his reputation was tarnished in some circles. And what we have, this is Harriet Mellon, who's always represented as a man for some reason, <laughs> um, uh, with her next husband. <laughs> um, this is the Duke of St. Albans. Um, and this is Coutts' money. And this is the ghost of Coutts, uh, who's coming back to... Uh, haunt them. Um, but actually, as I say, the, the real loser uh, from this action was uh, Thomas Coutts himself. Let's pull that together. Um, a conclusion. Um, and here, I'd like to start the conclusion with uh, this is an exchange from um, uh, a play of 1774 in the wake of the, the Air Bank crisis. And um, it's exchange, uh, the, the play, The Man of Business, was um, uh, about a character called Beverly, um, who was a, a young banker I I in a, uh, a city bank. And uh, what we have is the servant of Beverly who says, what has a man of business to do with men of pleasure? Why is a young banker to live with young noblemen? And what he's actually s quite rightly showing is that some... Uh, city bankers are now actually living in the West End. The bank stays in the West End, uh, in, in the city, but they actually live in the West End. Another of the servants says, and why not, Mr. Fable? Is not the business of the house carried on at the polite end of town? Does not he live in the very centre of persons of fashion? And has not he constant dealings with them? Not shut up in Lombard Street, where within the sound of Bow Bell, or in the site of the monuments, that is the post-fire mon monuments, not cramming turtle and venison uh, you know, at the king's arms, uh, which all the city men were seen to be, to be uh, much desirous of turtle. Um, uh, but they were balloted instead into the macaroni uh, and a member of the savoir vivre. You know, these are fashionable clubs. Um, so... What I like about you know, that extract is that I think it does, first of all, it actually highlights the enduring differences between the beau monde, if you like, and the city world. Those, those differences endure, and, and, and you know, Stefan very rightly says, uh, for, for many years, I, I think these differences between the middling and the upper classes remain. Um, and... Uh, and I think what we, we are seeing here, there is, that there is some change that's going on, but it's not change in the way in which the critic is suggesting. You know, I don't think the bankers are trying to become country gentlemen. Um, uh, and um, 
what I think it shows in, you know, in particular is the great public scrutiny of London bankers uh, during this period. Uh, and this is actually perhaps where the heart of my interest really lies here. It, it's, it's all about uh, the ways in which reputation you know, and, and trust were negotiated and, and managed uh, in uh, the long 18th century. Uh, you might be alarmed here that I could tell you more banker stories. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we could focus on other social and cultural strategies used by bankers uh, to secure an accommodation with the upper orders. Um, for instance, uh, we might discuss the importance uh, of the naming of firms um, and the order in which uh, bankers appeared um, uh, in the naming of firms. There's some interesting questions there. Um, or we could look at the remarkable parliamentary success uh, of London bankers by the turn of the 19th century. Um, uh, if you ignore nonconformist banks, uh, uh, there are as many bankers in Parliament uh, as there are London banks, for instance, um, uh, which is quite, quite a statistic. Um, uh, I mean, I think these studies uh, would show them acting in, in different and, and illuminating ways to their mercantile or, or other commercial brethren um, whose uh, impact in society was also limited or, or managed uh, by their particular commercial world. Uh, as I said, the, um, their goldsmithing past uh, certainly prepared bankers well for the challenges of engaging the upper orders uh, because they are de dealing in luxury goods. Um, but they could not desert their commercial roots in establishing that accommodation. Uh, I could say much more about the ways in bankers, you know, how they did mirror uh, the polite leisure uh, interests of, of the upper orders. That does happen. Um, but what I've hoped you've seen today is that beyond the hunt, yo, know, and, and the theatre, we should recognise that there's a deeper and more intimate rapprochement uh, between these social groups, um, which enabled uh, the man of business uh, to turn into a figure uh, of more uh, reassuring familiarity. And I think I'll stop there.